All right, good evening, everyone. We're gonna call the liquor board um, to order. And um, first up is public comment. This is public comment on anything for the liquor control board that's not on the agenda. And seeing none, um, we'll go to approval of the agenda. So just this was where if you want to amend it to have um, to do the one main tap and grill, um, I think it would be approve, approve the agenda as amended with that included. Tom, you're on mute. Yeah, there we go. I'll move approval of the agenda with the addition of one main tap and grill. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, motion carries. Uh, next up is the um, first class, third class and outside consumption permits. And um, so uh, just a question on this. There's um, outside consumption permits here, but I'm assuming that um, given the discussion is still coming later on tonight under the select board agenda for space for two entities that are in addition to what they've had in prior years, um, we're approving what they had in prior years. Um, because they look to me like in the application for our outside consumption for one main and it said basically what what we had last year um so that would lead me to believe there's an amendment coming or a change if the board agrees to additional space is that right trevor so yeah we understand this will be the renewal for the existing space and then pen, depending on how that later conversation turns out it may have to be that there's either a um, new outside consumption permit that covers the, the the added space or some sort of amendment to to the existing one. I don't know if Emery, if I summarize it, I think he talked to to DLC, so hopefully that's that's close to the process. It is. Okay. And the uh, space for um, Puya's uh, sandwiches does not include liquor, correct? No, okay. just uh, uh, two two tops. Um, for, for outside eating. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, anybody have any questions on the applications that are before the liquor control? Seeing none, anybody wanna make a motion? I'll move that we approve um, all the licenses in front of us on this portion of the agenda. I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained. Motion carries. A motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We'll now call the regular select board meeting to order. And first up is public comment. This is comment on anything that's not on the agenda. Robin, um, just uh, before we actually go there, Trevor, one of the things that we were working on was to um, get the various committees and groups together and have a schedule so that they had a designated month to report on what they were doing um, and give the board an update. Uh, there were some other groups that we're organizing to come at this time and do updates. So we're gonna to try to get that into kind of an organized fashion. So a lot of people thought I had a really good idea, it sounds like. <laughs> um, let me finish. I, have, I, I will be as brief as I can, folks. Um, the library would like to let you know that um, we have a personnel change. Um, after 22 wonderful years, Lynn Gately is retiring as our adult services librarian. And Michaela Angert is stepping in um, with a continued focus on programming for adults. Um, she comes to us most recently from Bear Pond Books in Montpelier, 
which is a lovely place to go if you are a book nerd, um, but also spent about 15 years doing city planning in Keene, New Hampshire, Germany, and elsewhere. So she has a, a pretty amazing breadth of experience. Um, we have a ton of planning and programming going on for youth this summer. Um, we received a $3,000 Libraries Transforming Communities grant to support community conversations about how we as a community can best support our youth. And as a part of that, um, the 10th grade social studies classes at, at RUHS will participate in a guided conversation about what they need as youth. And there, there will be opportunities for the youth themselves, parents, their caregivers, and other organizations that serve youth to participate in those conversations over the summer. Um, we also received a 1500 Rise Vermont grant for yoga instruction and equipment for tweens and teens. Um, and we will be, the board will, has a request on its agenda next week to approve accepting this grant um, that pops up later on the agenda here, I think. Um, we also applied with the rec department for $22,730 in Summer Matters for All grant. Um, addition, for additional enrollment and art sections for summer rec pro camps um, and drop-in camps for tweens and teens at the library. Um, this is also a retroactive request to apply later in the agenda. And our summer reading program for kids through sixth grade is, is in serious planning stages. Um, it was a gigantic success last year and we are looking forward to the same sort of success this year. So I'm happy to entertain any questions that I might be able to answer. We, you know, we, we the library is working very hard to serve the community um, at all of its different touch points, even though we don't have full opening privileges just yet, you know, because old building ventilation, COVID. So, so if there's anything else, anything that you all would like to know about. Robin, you want to give a plug for the bookstore? Oh my goodness! Um, please do donate. Yeah, the bookstore, the the friends of the of Kimball have been doing an amazing job keeping the bookstore open and supporting the library and just doing super super good work for us. Um, their hours are posted on a sandwich board in front of the library, and I would encourage people to take advantage of it. All kinds. Of, I donate books down there. Um, all kinds of good stuff comes it goes in and out of those that space so yeah yeah we've we kind of sucked Janet over from Chandler to to us so see it's like they sucked me over and now they brought Janet over too so <laughs> all right we have any questions for the library seeing none thank you Robin you are Next welcome is, uh, approval of the agenda do we have any changes we need, Trevor? <clears throat> Not that I'll, I have for you. I'll move the approval of the agenda as stated. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Consent calendar. So approval of minutes and warrants. Motion to approve the consent calendar. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next up is new business. First up, our outdoor requests for dining. Let's take these one at a time. If we could start with the um, Kuya's sandwiches request. Yep, they approached uh, me shortly after I started and what the request is for is a pair of uh, two tops so smaller tables that would fit right under the windows in front of the storefront. Um, they'd be in the sidewalk there'd be plenty of space to meet the ADA clearance requirements there's been outside seating at that location with prior businesses it was a picnic table that was set a little farther away from the um, from the front of the store in the little triangle area between the, the steps and the in the ramp. Um, and it was sort of the same considerations of maintaining access at all times. So they just want to augment some of their seating capacity, want those two two tops um, directly out in front of the store. Um, and that's 
the request. I can pull up a map if folks want to see it on a Google map or anything like that to, to get a better idea. So these are probably similar to the ones that were there when Pages Ice Cream was operating out of the front of Ben Franklin. The only problem we had with those was the size of the umbrella that they put on the table kind of came out over the table quite a ways. Um, so I just need to make sure they stay in that smaller footprint, I think. Anybody yeah, have they, any questions? They didn't mention umbrellas, but I think we can we can certainly pass that on just in case. Any questions on that one? I have a question, Trini. Um, I saw the email about including the town in the insurance, mm -hmm. but I didn't see any discussion of that. Is that something that we automatically do with everybody or? It is. <clears throat> so they don't get the permit unless we have that first? Correct. Any other questions on that one? If not, anybody want to make a motion on that one? I'll move the approval of the Kaya's uh, outdoor seating permit. Second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Next up is a request from One Main Tap and Grill for outdoor dining. And Shane, who is uh, the owner of One Main, is here. Um, in your package, you had a, a map. I can pull that up, folks, for folks, real quick. If you just want to see what he's asking for, um, let me just see here. And folks, see that? Okay. You should you should see a picture, a hand drawn picture. Yes. Just yes. Fine. Yeah. Just so fine. just to kind of ori orient you, there's the um, existing outdoor seating area that's sort of at the bottom of the screen, and then one main sits directly behind it. The sidewalk kind of curves around all of that area, and then it's hard to see the cursor on the on the white background, but um, over here where I just highlighted is roughly the area that um, is the requested area to augment some of this capacity. And so it's from about, there's a, a loading zone um, tow away sign that's currently kind of marks the edge of this. The parking that's on Merchants Row starts behind it. There's a door to the red line right about where the, the language is that, that indicates red line. And so the request is for that eight by, and then is it about 40 feet is what it looks like. Um, yes. Is what's known. Yep, but coming up and then sort of curving off to allow for, um, you know, to enable some of those turning motions. So this would augment this outdoor seating that's been previously approved that's over oops, on um, this side right here that's about a nine by 30 space I think is at least what the maps indicate um, and it would put this seating area inside of everything inside I guess was it last year there was some discussion about um, kind of farther down on Main Street trying to augment some of the seating there but there were some challenges with liquor control um, given kind of the distance from the restaurant being able to to see patrons they would have had to have a monitor so there were some challenges with with that space when that was discussed last year um, so just to, to reiterate real quickly um, this is the the requested additional outside dining in this area and would be um, subject to an outside consumption permit either amendment or, or, or a new permit depending on what dlc requires so Trevor, how wide is Merchant's Row? I can. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure, but I'll pull up a separate window here and see if I can at least get like a Google measure to give you a sense. In that spot. Some of I'm the about... discussion last year, wasn't it, that we were gonna close Merchant's Row during certain hours to allow that to be used by multiple entities versus seating people out into Merchants Row, <clears throat> the traffic still flowing. Yep. So it's about 20, 26 feet is the rough Google map measure that I've got just kind of going, but there's some shadows and stuff, so give or take. And how close are the cars parked on the right-hand side? To this area? Um, yeah. 
they would be there's one parking space that would almost back up against um one end of the whatever the seating or barrier area area would be um there's a space right after that no toes or tow aways zone sign um, that kind of demarcates the the two areas at least at this moment they can park on the opposite side too correct right there yeah, there's one yeah one just kind of staggered a little bit it's about the same sort of orientation it looks like it's maybe down a little bit from there so are we going to construct barriers or anything like that along that line or what's the plan yeah the plan would be to have jersey bat barriers on that outer perimeter facing the traffic uh lane so i have a problem with that because as somebody who drives big trucks and trucks do go in there Sometimes you do have to make a wider swing and you're over into that lane on the left hand side so you can get there because sometimes people park or they're not supposed to park on the other side of the street. So I'm a little concerned about putting anything in there in a permanent way. Okay. I think there's a, what is the risk to the town if we allow people to sit right up next to a traveled lane of traffic? Well, the crim it's similar to what the crim had last year. They're just further down. We closed the road, though. No, we didn't. No, we didn't. No. No, we no. didn't. So, so what we did for the crim was, because they were further down, they did get concrete between them and the patrons, but the concrete didn't extend beyond the parking spaces, so they weren't in the traveled lane. Right. This is the same here, but I see your concern, Perry. With, that was our only concern is, like, what about turning traffic trying to get in there? Well, I'm just telling you, somebody who drives a truck, I tell you, I've swinged yeah. in there and sometimes people park on the other side of the road. So now you're going to create a bottleneck for traffic. So if you put something there permanently, you know, that's a problem during the daytime hours. You guys can come up with a solution that, you know, in my mind, you can put there during the hours you're open in the afternoon. I, I don't have a problem with that. So. Okay. Well, but you've got to put something between the people that are seated and traffic all the way around. Right. Correct. Right that's not it's not just at the entrance like because once you get in there you and you have to maneuver the widths of vehicles are different too you put a prius in there versus you know a truck with a flatbed on it it's a lot different the width you're taking up and then you got to maneuver around that i've gone down through there before and had to you know jog one way and jog the other depending on traffic you know car sizes i'm just I can tell you, I'm just not a fan of this. So I wanted to go back to revisiting why the Liquor Control Board told you guys you couldn't do that because Sarah was able to do what she did. And, you know, her distance from the edge of her storefront to where she put tables was, wasn't that much different. So I'm curious why all of a sudden this would become an issue here. Because, you know, in my mind, what we tried to create for you guys on the other side, you know, adjacent to the piece that you already had, was a viable solution. So I want to know what happened with liquor control. Well, I appreciate what you tried to do, Perry. Um, but this is coming straight from a conversation with Michael Welch, who's our local investigator for DLC in the Randolph area. Um, and basically, because it's out of sight of the restaurant visually through the windows, because it was in front of Clara Martin versus in front of one main tap and grill. And so it was in front of another storefront, which was visually not very, you know, good to be able for us to be able to keep an eye on that space. Plus you had to walk across the public traveled way to get there going across the sidewalk where in the spot that I proposed, it's very visual from all of the big windows on the merchant side, uh, you know, roadside of the restaurant. So it keeps it easier to keep an eye on patrons there from inside and outside the restaurant. Yeah, and, and he didn't say we couldn't use it. He said we had to have a monitor present to watch people going in and out of that area if alcohol all was time. served over there. Yeah, all the time. It's like having a beer garden, you'd have to have somebody at the door checking IDs, letting people in and out so that, you know, minors aren't slipping in there when you're not looking because the visual wasn't enough to satisfy him with that location. And it could have been his just, just his judgment call 
based on where it is and what our line of sight was for that particular area. But that's what he told us had to be done. And his comment to me was, why wouldn't you do it on the Merchant's Row side? Um, and of course, that's what I'm proposing now, which I've already run it by DLC and Michael Welch, uh, the lead investigator for this area. Um, and he sees no problem with it in that area. He thinks that's a better spot for it than where it was in front of Clara Martin Center. Oh, that's because he's not an AOT guy. That's right. <laughs> I, I'm just saying. It, yeah, I get it. I get it. DLC. <laughs> okay, that's I'm right. just telling you. I mean, these 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 two agencies don't work well together. I, you know, I went through a lot of this stuff last summer trying to create parklets for everybody, and you know, there's a lot of hoops to jump through. And I'm just, you know, I would love to have Trevor maybe follow up with him and uh, see if there's some other workable solution to get you guys on that side of the street because it's going to create less of a traffic problem in my mind. Is, I wonder if, is it possible for us to um, close the sidewalk um, during those um, evening hours when you want to serve? Um, no. and that way we don't have this, the, the, you know, the problem with the street. No, you have to remain ADA compliant. Right. And you got the entrance to Red Lion right there, which is exactly. elderly wow. folks that need that compliant yeah. access. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they, they wouldn't compliant. like it if we did that. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> they would not be our friends if we did that. <laughs> no, in, 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 in touching on Perry's point, um, that's why I angled that area of the outdoor seating to allow more room for vehicles making that turn as I've driven many big trucks in my lifetime with trailers and I know what it's like to try to turn and make that that corner and that's why that depicted area has a 45 degree bevel on that outer slope to allow that extra room for making that corner. Has anybody done a plan that looks at uh, traffic movements and what it would take for space for safer barriers uh, to be around the entire seating and then how that impacts the parking areas on Merchants Row as well as you know the safety of all the different users there. I just think we're trying to pack a lot into the entrance of Merchants Row that's I'm not really comfortable with the town making a decision to allow this without protecting the people that are sitting there, but also looking at what that means for the traffic operations. You know, if we wanted to say at, like we did last year, at a certain hour, Merchants Row is closed, and then- We didn't, the, we didn't close Merchants Row last year. We did not, no. I lived we, on Merchants Row, it was always open. No, no, no we, we wanted to train, we, yeah, we couldn't we seem to make this, that happen. We had yeah, this we whole conversation about closing it at whatever time it was. Five o'clock. That's a much, yeah, we were waiting for the- I'd, uh, I'd love that. <laughs> That'd be time, great. But it's a, that to me is a much safer discussion than trying to mix people sitting having dinner with moving traffic and, and whatnot. Yeah. That just to me, those don't mix. Well, that's kind of, you know, I mean, if we put a temporary, any kind of temporary barrier is not gonna, is not gonna be the same as a concrete Jersey barrier there. Right. Um, well, unless just, like she had said, if we close the street itself at a certain time and we can set up our seating, like, you know, a, a removable barricade right across the entire merchant's row, no traffic. So let me tell you what the problem was here. Okay, the big problem okay. here was Fish, Fisher Auto. Okay, so Fisher was, we, you know, we were trying to accommodate them and so the proposal, you know, went back and forth and about, you know, how to create some outdoor seating space for all of you folks, you know, and so now, okay, we've had a few changes in businesses, we've got a little bit more activity there. Um, I personally would have any problem working out a way to close Merchants Row at five o'clock to vehicle traffic and then reopen it again at midnight. Um, and you guys then would have the opportunity to put your stuff on the street in those areas so that would probably benefit you know, the three businesses that are currently down there right now. And, you know, I think it would be a, a great step. Um, you know, I've for the longest time thought Merchants Row should be pedestrian only. Um, I, but I agree. 
but yeah, but, but, but it's, it's 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 a it's a change that you know a lot of people hate change so um we'd have to accommodate bailey's and, or or whatever fisher auto parts Bailey. at this point <laughs> wow that's that's going back a ways <laughs> well sorry but, you know they used to own the block so yeah right yeah yeah, yeah, I yeah remember. okay that, I just dated myself. All right. But anyways, <laughs> the point is I would be in favor more of trying to figure out how to close Merchants Row at five o'clock. And, you know, at least, you know, maybe it's a pilot program. Maybe we just try it for the summer, you know, into the fall. And then, you know, we've got a pedestrian friendly area. Maybe we could attract some food trucks, you know, hate to give you guys some competition, but it might become. No, no, it know, invites more... you. I mean, it's, it's there's great. no competition. Might... No. The more the merrier. Okay. And yeah, then on top of that, you know, there, that'd be great. Yeah. Well, and then on top of that, you know, you might be able to create, you know, on a weekend, you might be able to do, you know, some music stuff there, you know, on right. a Saturday night or something. I, I, I don't know that I'd love to see that happen. I'm just one member. So we'll let the rest yeah. weigh in. I agree with you, Perry. I think I, I mean, it's a stretch, but it should be the church street marketplace, the block long church street marketplace of Randolph. If we can make it work for Fisher. And I'm presuming they close at five o'clock. Is that they correct? do? They do. Yeah. 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 So what, what do you want to do? Call to call it the Little Chapel Marketplace. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's uh, toss this back um, to Trevor to work with folks and see what an arrangement like that might look like, and if it means that we have to review this prior to the June Select Board meeting totally capable of doing that through an email process and ratify it in the June meeting. But right now, I just don't, I, we have a full agenda. So spending more time trying sure. to get the right answer isn't going to happen tonight. And I'd like to move yep. forward with the rest of the agenda. Tim, is that work, <laughs> Trevor? Okay, can, can, and Shane oh. and, and, uh, Shane and Josh, can you kind of live with that for a little bit? Yeah, if that ends up being the solution, I, I think that's worth, you know, I mean, well, I think that, either doing the barriers, we'd have to do a traffic study. So, yeah. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, saying okay it's, it's, I'm not saying it's the solution, but it's certainly something right. I would love to investigate. And I think the community would actually like it. So, yeah. I, I think the community would love it. Shane? I'm seeing, I'm seeing Janet over there in the corner shaking her head. She, she's already liking this idea, huh? Well, like I said, <laughs> okay. I, mean, I, I would love, and I, I've always been a proponent for shutting that street down to pedestrian only. So if we could get that from five o'clock on, that would be great. Um, I guess my only take on it was, you know, like, how could we do this uh, expeditiously so that way it's the summer's not over by the time we get an answer on this, like, I mean, how how does that timeline work? Shane, you just heard we're willing to consider a solution before the June meeting. I think okay. you got to step back and you got to work with Trevor okay, okay. on this one and see. Oh no, what that's great. I, I just I was just trying to and clarify that. Isn't that? Yeah. yeah. So I think we've beat this one, and I'd like to keep moving on this agenda if we can. Um, okay. Pass that one to you guys to meet. Uh, I think Perry's interested in participating in some of that. And um, anybody else who is? I, I'd be happy to participate as well. I think it's a great idea. Okay, we perfect. Have, great. We have Trevor um, think about hours of operation too with people living in that area. Yeah, I think that's perfectly appropriate, Pat. All right. So next up on the agenda is the credit card processing vendor selection and authorization. Yeah, so I, um, this is Cliff, uh, finance director. Um, I spoke with, I, I solicited quotes, tried to solicit information from five different vendors, only two re actually responded. Um, it's, it's something that's been being looked at. I'll, I'll use quotes for looked at for quite a long time. Um, and I offered to try, um, Emery to take the lead on it. Um, I spoke to two of the vendors, Municipe and um, governmentportal.com. Um, the long and short of it is Municipe has a better fee structure and their reporting is um, more intuitive and easier to, 
from an appearance standpoint from the demo um, was easier to use <clears throat> and Municipay also interacts quite well with um, Heidi's rec program. I spoke to the rec director over in Bath, Maine who uses rec.com and they use Municipay for their credit card processing said it run, went over really well. So um, I'm recommending that we contact Municipay and get this thing set up as, as soon as we can. So Cliff, can you just go over with us how that would work? You know, what are we, what's the percentage of our revenues we would lose? Are we going to allow it for property tax payments or just rec payments and water, wastewater yep. payments? Yep. Good, good questions, Trini. Um, the, the, the users of the credit card payment program will actually pay the fees. The town will not be out any revenue. Um, there's a, um, a, a dollar fifty minimum fee, um, or two point six five percent of the transaction, um, whichever is greater. <clears throat> so if you do just a small transaction, you're still going to pay the buck fifty. Um, Municipal has told me that it shows as two transactions, and the user is asked if they are going to authorize the user fee. If they do not authorize the user fee, the payment does not go through. Um, and there's a dollar fifty flat fee for um, any electronic checks that are done. Um, so the town is not out any of the revenue. Um, we do plan on um, taking cards at the counter, and Heidi will be doing cards if she needs it at the rink and the pool. Um, we will need reader equipment, um, and that's one hundred and ninety dollars um, per um device and so we would do online both online and at the window and in each case um the transaction fee would show up as as a separate transaction to hit the cards so let me get this clear <clears throat> so if we do this it's the person making the payment would be responsible for the payment or the fee charged by the credit card company? That's correct, Perry. Thank you. And the fee that they pay is like a percent or something? It's a flat $1.50 minimum or 2.65% of the transaction, Pat, whichever is greater. And that, co that covers anything, yeah. OK. so. Uh, Go ahead. So go ahead, Cliff. Yeah, that, that those fees go directly to the credit card company. We do not touch them. Right. So the credit card processor, let's just say somebody, somebody wanted to pay their tax bill and it's $10,000. Yep. They would be notified that they're also going to pay a $260 or no, 20, what would it be? 2.6? Uh, 2.65. Yeah, 2.65, right? Yep. So, so they would... So they're going to be notified that in order to do that, they would pay that fee before that transaction occurred. That's correct. It'll be part of that same transaction, Perry. Right. So, so that's, okay, I just want to make sure because right. I can see this, you know, escalating into a, well, nobody told me I was going to get charged $265 when I paid my taxes to use my credit card. I've, <laughs> I have been told by the credit card company that it shows up as part of the authorization that says, yes, I authorize this fee. Okay, as long as you have that paperwork, I don't care how they do it. Yeah, if they want to yeah. use their credit card, I'm fine with it. But I want to make sure that it's perfectly clear that when they hit the send button, that we have some documentation that says you authorize this because I can see people walking into the office going, You guys charged me $265 on my $10,000 bill here. <laughs> okay, so. I'm just trying to save you guys some headache and me some phone oh, yeah. calls. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I agree, Perry. It's, it's one of those things of they're going to authorize the transaction for the use of the system. And that's, okay. that's, that is how it's set up. Okay. Well, I'm totally fine with it. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 will, I, I will say that um, I said as soon as possible, um, my goal is to have it up and running by um, the end of summer. Um, and you'll ask why not. And I'm, I'm sorry to say that I'm going to be out on medical leave for a while. So um, I'll do it as soon as I can. I'm perfectly fine with that cliff as long as it, you know, cause I can just, 
I, I think everybody's been chomping at the bit for this. So, okay, you can chomp at the bit, but it comes in price. <laughs> yep, I agree. The, the bit costs you 2.65. So, hey, <laughs> there, it's their choice as long as the window says, I authorize this transaction. Right. Okay. So the only question I have on this clip is uh, if we move forward a little bit, the, the new return payment policy that we're going to discuss next, if I enter in to make a payment, do I not get a message back immediately that says there's a problem with making this charge? I'm not, I'm, uh, I, I usually... think that, that there's, there's up to a, um, I want to say it's a, uh, so the credit card will clear in two days. So, um, and so if it gets returned, it, it sh would be within that 48 hour period. So I, I don't have a definitive answer for you, Trini. I know in the case of an e-check, an e-check will take three days, up to three days to clear, and that could conceivably bounce. Okay. All right. It just seems like some of those online things are like instant, but must be theirs is goes through a different system. Yeah, I, I, I know that, um, you know, when I pay my credit card online, it takes anywhere from 24 to 48 hours from the time I pull the trigger on the transaction until the time I see it in my bank account. Okay. Any other questions on the credit card vendor? So I just want to be clear. We're, we're talking about Municipay? We're talking about Municipay. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. You know where I'm going, right? <laughs> no, I don't. Hey, okay. Uh, hey, Trini, this is Heidi. Um, I just want to let you guys know that um, for this credit card with Myrec, I did have to sign a disclaimer that we were not going with another preferred um, credit card company or portal. And so there are some things that we will not be given with Myrec. And so... I had to sign off on things like we won't be, my reg is not responsible for some of the losses through the credit card transactions. Well, those losses would only be returned where they didn't clear their card, at which point we just wouldn't, we wouldn't allow the services. The only challenge I see is the POS payments. Like, are yeah. we going to accept this at the rink when somebody's buying a, uh, hot chocolate or something, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's more like sometimes the balances are, are paid twice or double paid, but if we keep track of this, you know, on a daily basis, I think we'll be fine. I'm just letting you know that we did have to sign off a disclaimer that we're not using a preferred gateway through my rec. That's all. So when we look at um, what we'll be accepting credit cards for, other than just like registration for camps and things like that, are you looking at accepting this for like pool fees for the day and those type of things? I'm sorry, Jay, I didn't hear that. I have a, a whiny kid here. Sorry. <laughs> we've all been there i've got a whiny adult around here some days lately but um i'm i guess the uh if we look at the policy and know that these credit card transactions can take two even three days to clear accepting them for like day fees to use the pool or purchases of snacks and whatnot um we're going to be allowing that activity uh, before we know if the credit card's gonna clear. So then what do we do if it doesn't clear? It seems like we might be taking on the burden of staff time to chase small amounts of money. Yeah, yeah maybe I, I think, can, sorry, Cliff. Uh, I was just gonna say, maybe I can get some clarification on in terms of um, the approval of the of the transaction versus the time that it takes to hit our account. 
Yeah, it seems like you'd want to know that you were going to be receiving that revenue for sure you know, on things that are an immediate exchange, if that makes sense, like the immediate access for the day at the pool or the immediate access for the skating rink or um, those type of things versus, I mean, obviously, if you're paying registration fees, and whatnot, you've got more time to balance that one out. But I just don't want to see us have this burden where now we're having to chase people down for their $5 because they used a credit card. My understanding is that the way the credit cards work is that the, the vendor gets paid. And then if the, the person made, who made the purchase um, decides that, um, that, that there's a problem with that purchase for some reason that they need to then go to the credit card and company and then you know go through a process of trying to work that out. But in the meanwhile, the, the vendor still gets their money and they could have it taken back out of them if, if, if there was some sort of legitimate gripe. But um, I think that you know, the, the pair will need to go through some sort of a process that is independent of the um, of the of the vendor at least at least at first. Well, this would my be, understanding. I don't think we're going to be chasing down. anybody down. Well, okay, hold on. My understanding is, <clears throat> if you process that credit card, it's either denied or approved instantly. Right. Yeah, that's the way mine work. Okay, I mean we we get them and you know somebody charges up some stuff and it's denied, and if it's denied, then there's no charge, <clears throat> and if the credit card company accepts, and we get approval then they're going to make me whole. The only time you run into a conflict there is if they challenge the cart, if they challenge the charge. Right. And then so you just, there, yeah. The question was in response, Cliff said it can take two to three days to clear. But, yes. Yeah, and, I, and, and I think I need some clarification for you about um, the, um, I think the two days is for money hitting our account for them processing it um, and, and not necessarily them approving the charge. And so I, I just need to um, clarify that for purposes of this particular, these particular transactions. Right. So approval or denial is usually instantaneous though, correct? It's just how much time yeah. it takes. To, yeah, yeah. Right, I mean, I, that's how it works right. in our account. So, so if sure. I take somebody's check or I take somebody's credit card and it's either approved or denied instantly, if it's denied, we go back and say, okay, great, your card was denied. What do you what do you got? And then they either get another card and then we get approval. Once we got approval, that money is not withdrawn from my account unless they can test the charges. So I think the transaction time where <clears throat> let's just say ID sells ten dollars worth of goods, that's gonna go into our account two days later. It's been approved. I doubt that you're gonna come back and you're gonna back bill you for the ten bucks. Is that under clear? Yeah. No, yeah, that's that's yeah. very clear. Um, and, and and like with Cliff, we'll work on it in, after the summer, so we won't mm -hmm. jump in right away with with the with the pool and stuff, which is kind of nice. I think jumping in in the fall and slowly working it way, then we can kind of work out those kinks and the reporting. So I think we'll be fine. Yeah, if we get an immediate notification of whether it's good or not good, then I think there's no risk there. Yeah, and it makes sense. If it's like yep. two days later, you find out whether you actually got a charge or not, then I got a challenge with it. But well, if and, it's and, the way regular credit cards work, then that's great. Yeah. Any other questions okay. on that, or if not, motion? I'll make a, I'll make the motion that we uh, take the recommendation and use Municipal to. Um, <clears throat> Used for paying anything, town finances and other necessary things from the rec department and whatever else you want to include. I will second. Okay. Make sure that says and whatever else you want to include. <laughs> right. Put that on there. <laughs> 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 uh, giving a lot it. of leeway there. I mean, well, okay. So, we, so we're going to. Okay, I'll give you more specific. Okay, so water sewer bills, correct? Yep. Okay, taxes. Taxes. Recreational Any town receipts. Any town receipts? They're perfect. Thank you, Trini, for fixing that for me. You're Dog welcome. Dog licenses, whatever. 
<laughs> yeah, dog licenses, absolutely. Okay, town receipts. She's got the right terminology there, okay? Perfect. All right, we still have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Stained? Motion carries. Uh, return payment item policy. So in conjunction with this, because now we're opening up um, our methodology of receiving payments, um, the return, it used to be a return check policy. Um, and I have reworded it to return payment, return payment item policy um, to encompass these things called e-checks and other ways of that they might pay that they could argue, well, I didn't, I didn't actually write a check, so you, you can't hit me with the fee. Um, and so the, the essence of this is to um, open, broaden the definition of what a returned item is to um, include a check, e-check, debit card payment, credit card payment, or any other similar or equivalent means of conveying money or funds from one party to another. Um, and then entering in some um, definitions and also um, raising the fee from 25 associated with it from $25 that we currently charge for a return check to $35. Just, just to be clear, how would that work with a credit card? We just discussed the fact that the, the transaction is either approved or declined at the point of sale, if you will. Is this, does this apply to credit card payments that are made on a form and mailed in? Or I'm not quite clear how credit card payments work here. I'm not sure that I understand your question, Tom. Well, it, it, it says here a declined card. Does that mean that when somebody's card is declined, we're going to hit them with a. I'm not. I'm not sure how credit cards fit here. I guess is what I'm asking. Uh, they're they're different from a balance check because they're declined at the point of the transaction or approved. Where, right? where does it say a, def, <clears throat> a declined card? On, under background um, on the action item sheet, it says the return payment item policy deals with among other things what happens when a payment made isn't completed a bounce check or declined card for example got it yeah, that, that, that was my example just trying to put together a, a quick action sheet and I oh, think okay when you, when you think of the credit card policy at this point leaving it in the policy is protection if for some reason there is a gap even if there isn't likely to be one and transactions are instantaneous right this gives us a little bit of protection if for some reason who knows what happens um we've right. covered all the potential payment options that are out there okay. that could conceivably fall under this. So yeah, it was, uh, that was my trying to illustrate what it could okay. cover. And, All right. Yeah. Yeah. And I was reading directly from the policy, Tom. So. Okay. Yeah. You might have somebody who challenges the payment with their credit card company and it gets reversed and then you got to go back at them to collect it another way. Right. In that case, they should pay the additional fee, which is meant to cover your, your personnel time and and cost. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Certified mail fee, um, that, that sort of thing. Exactly. Okay. I get Claire, it. Claire, I have another question. Um, what if somebody pays their taxes on the last day and the check bounces? Are they delinquent or do they get so many days to make the check good? I, I would argue that they're delinquent, Pat. I would too. I'm just, it's not clear. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the, the point of it is if they, if the, if the check bounces, they haven't made payment. Right. So and that's not this policy. That is not this policy. I, I, I think that'll come under the delinquent tax policy because they haven't actually paid. I mean, because we would have to reverse the check that we recorded <clears throat> that was no good when they wrote it. Um, for whatever reason, uh, and then assess all the penalties and, and interest and whatever other fees there might have been associated with the delinquent payment. So there's no um, time in which you can make it good. You, you're going to be due the penalty. 
I'm yeah. sorry, Pat, I didn't understand all your words. You don't, you don't have 10 days to make the check good or anything yeah. like that. Automatically. Uh, <laughs> Not in this policy. No. That, that becomes like a de facto 10 day extension and it renders the deadline kind of moot if you write a bounced check on the day taxes are due. Oh, no, We're all going to write bad checks on the last day to keep that money another 10 days if that's the case, Pat. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's, why I'm, that's why I'm saying it doesn't oh, yeah. seem clear. And... That, that would be a mighty expensive bounced check. <laughs> yep. All right, so when we look at this uh, return payment policy, are there any other questions about that policy? No, no. If not, any motions to approve it? Somebody wanted oh, so moved. I'll, I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Abstain? Motion carries. Changing our authorized representative to the state revolving fund. This is, yep, just this is a housekeeping item with the change in town manager. Adolfo had been the authorized rep and Trini still set up as the alternate. And the authorized rep is the person who is able to submit any of the reimbursement requests, which is how these drinking water loan funds are set up. So this would just shift that over to me so that as we kind of queue up for the new wells and reservoir project, we've got this all taken care of well ahead of time. Any concerns with that? Any motions? I'll move to uh, change the designation to Trevor Lashua. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, aye. Aye. And motion carries. Beanville Road Culvert Project. There are just a couple of things here. Um, one was to revisit the, the guardrail and to come back to whether or not to um, go through with the decision to replace the W beam guardrail that's there. We've got an updated price for that. It's um, there was an earlier estimate from the fall that I think was part of the of the April conversation. That's now about sixteen thousand five hundred dollars just for the rails, um, and uh, it seems to be that there's some general concurrence among all the parties at this point that it's prudent to replace that rail for for safety reasons, um, given how it's been uh, used and abused through the years, um, and some spots worse than others. So this is about ratifying whether or not to ratify that decision to replace the guardrail. Um, our contractor is is waiting that decision and, and, and it's a good time in the process. Um, there was a question about post spacing. I don't know if you want to go into that. It looks like the six foot three inches is where um, we were envisioned to be. If we want to move to the eight foot, it was a, a, a reference in a, an invitation to bid that the town actually put together in digging back to the, the origins of the document itself. Um, most of the reference seems to be to the six foot three inch. And this is how far apart. The posts are, um, which gets into how well it functions in a safety situation. Um, and then I can do a quick update on the project whenever you're ready, but I thought maybe we'd do guardrail first and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of the utility things that have come up as we get ready for, for road closure and construction. Okay, so for folks that aren't aware, six foot three is the standard. Um, so you go against the standard, you absorb all the risk of the functionality of the guardrail. So you're going away from the engineering specs and the MUTCD um, recommendations. So I would not recommend that we go to the eight foot spacing because the risk all then lies on the town of how that guardrail functions should somebody hit it. Um, but we also have some damaged W panels. Um, down there so we can't just reuse like what was thought the material that's on site. Um, so we did have uh, the, the district four um, project manager go look at it. Uh, his recommendation is that we not reuse what's there. Um, he believes that it, it is compromised. Um, so part of our challenge is we do have those documents. They are public record now. So um, if we choose to reuse it, again, all the risk will come back over onto the town. 
but it's an element they've got to pull it all out and put it back in anyway so it's it's just not putting back the old one so it's not sort of an extra task when you when you think of it that way at least it's just the cost for for the materials and i will make so a motion to approve the replacement of a w beam guardrail for 16508 on the beamville road culvert project second it all those in favor aye, aye. opposed Sustained motion carries. Next up is the ARPA funding and guidelines update. Oh, wait, we need an update on the project first, Trevor. Sorry. I was going to say, yeah, if you want, I'm going to do another. <laughs> I know you're going too fast. I couldn't even find the share screen button. Um, so I'm going to just pull up a little um, printout. Can folks see that okay? Yep. So this is a rough uh, uh, shot of the project area, and um, there are a couple of utility-based things that we're now going to have to work around that weren't necessarily fully considered in some of the earlier stages, and, and we're not quite sure if there are cost ramifications, and if so, what they are. They, at a minimum, will make some of the um, culvert installation itself a little more challenging, just because you can't take the crane and kind of swing it in to this sort of space in between, you know, is the rough sort of area. Where the new culvert will go in next to the old one and so the first piece is this rectangle here on um, what's sort of the outflow side um, is what there is just inside the guardrail that's there um, buried a few feet down and encased in sort of a concrete box are um, fiber optic cables and in, inside of three conduits so what they've actually got to do is they can't disconnect them or remove them they're going to have to um, get in there, and this is consolidated communication is the, is the owner of these. So what they're going to do is actually excavate this area down to that concrete box. They'll bust the box open, take those conduits, and essentially strap them together, and then install a pole roughly at either end of this rectangle and, um, and string those, those cables across. So they'll be up a little bit, you know, a little bit farther out of the roadway and up a little bit higher than they would be if they were just kind of hanging there in the roadway. But what it means is that any of the wing walls or other pieces that go in to this side of it, because it's going in in, in segments, almost like a caterpillar um, is one way to think about it. Um, they'll either have to kind of come down, you know, kind of down this way to place pieces. So down and around um, the bank or try to kind of come around and in from under this side in here. And so they've they've figured out that solution. This is something they've done in other projects. One of the challenges is how steep it is from the road down to the bottom of this bank. Um, and so because of that, for to meet some of the safety regulations, it's not you know just a straight cut. They've got to terrace it back so it's a wider opening than you might have if you had less of a slope there. And so they're working through that. That might add a couple of, of days to the calendar, but we've got it sort of factored into that road closure um, period of time. So what we're looking at is road closure starting on um, May 24th and then lasting till about uh, August 2nd. And that seems a little conservative. So we might be able to, if the project goes up, goes better than expected. It'll also be the first project that does that that I've ever been on, but um, it's theoretically possible. Uh, we could open it up sooner. And so then um, the other piece to that you know, they can get in and it's a little bit easier to do this fiber optic stuff once the road's already closed. So it better enables that. Um, you can see this white line up here is roughly what they're able to do. Originally, they thought um, they'd be able to move that power pole back somewhere over kind of in this area over here um, or, or thereabouts so farther back, which would swing that whole line back and out of the way. But after they've looked at the site, considered some of the factors related to, to what this area down here is, tree trimming, they were able to move it about 25 feet, which is about what's shown, give or take. There's a pole relocation on this end over here um, that's going to occur too as they try to just realign poles in that area. But what it means is that that red line shows about where the power lines and all the other lines on the poles are going to be after they move the pole. The challenge with that is in this area right here on the upstream side. Um, again, think of the caterpillar in the segments. They've got to try to figure out how to drop the, the wing walls or the head walls in, in the first two or three segments while being mindful of this wire. Um, if they're live and active serving the businesses that are just up the road, and it, those seem to be the main four entities impacted, um, they can't get as close with the crane. It makes it a harder task 
to get in there. So there's some talk about, say, a, a Saturday, Saturday temporary shutdown of power and to use that time because they can get within 10 feet of the power line that, that way with the crane, I guess. And it facilitates an easier placement of some of those pieces. And the plan roughly is to start at this downstream end and, and work back if I'm remembering correctly. So there are some of those variables that are in there. They may add to the cost at, at some point. We don't have any order of magnitude or any of that yet, um, but there are elements that will have to be dealt with and worked around. Um, so that's sort of the general update uh, based on what's happened in the last three weeks, really, is when a lot of this is, is, has come to light and um, you know, some of the planning details have been worked out. Thanks, Trevor. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Each, so, each segment weighs 22 tons in case you're ever quizzed. Each culvert segment is your factoid of the day. You can impress and wow people with it. <laughs> nice. Mm -hmm. uh, so what's the, what's, the to, what's the total culvert way? Uh, you have that one? <laughs> I don't have that one. That, that'll be next month's trivia. I'm just, I'm not trying oh, to Okay, it good. That's, yeah, because that'll be the next question. Well, that's great. How many segments are there? <laughs> that's, that's June's trivia question, yeah. Oh, good. Well, you keep me updated. <laughs> <laughs> no cheating, Perry. That's right. No, no cheating. I happen to know somebody who does precast. I guess I'll check into that. <laughs> <laughs> ARPA funding. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to put this in front of you initially. Um, I think we're still a little little ways away from fully digesting everything um, th that we need to know about the funding that's going to come directly to us. But um, this week, the U.S. Treasury Department released its initial guidelines, their interim final rule, and really what those are, are the parameters for which the ARPA money um, can be spent. And uh, they try to make a lot of connections to COVID related impacts when you look at the fact sheet that was in the packet. And mm -hmm. so at a minimum, what we're talking about is a direct uh, appropriation, essentially, it'll come through the state to us. Um, Burlington, I think is the only entity that's gonna get a direct payment to them from the federal government. Um, but we're talking about a little more than $453,000 is that base. There's some conversation continued about what to do. There's about $120 million in county uh, government money that's coming to Vermont but with our county government system or lack thereof. There's been some talk about how to spread that out. So there's some thought that the local totals might at some point end up augmented by some or all of those money. I looked yeah. today to see if I could find an update and I, I just didn't see anything new-ish on that. Um, so rough timeline is that we've got until 2024 to use um, these funds. We may see them. I found out later today, Cliff, um, the, the state has 30 days from when they request the funding to pass it on to, we're called a non-entitlement unit, so to pass it on to pretty much everybody but Burlington. There's a 30-day window, and Karen Horn at VLCT said that they thought around June 9th um, would be the date that we might, might see that. And VLCT is advising that, at least at this point, set that money somewhere where it's safe, it's set aside, where it can't be inadvertently used for some of the prohibited uses um, while you sort of learn what the rules do allow and talk about how we're going to use it. Um, and so the, the fact sheet that's in there is a few pages long, but it goes through um, some of the categories and I tried to summarize them there. Like I said, they, they want to have them have a direct tie to COVID impacts if possible. So some of the, the prohibited uses would be to, to lower tax rates or to put them into um, you know infrastructure equipment purchases or projects that don't have some sort of direct connection or, or some element of, I think it's water, wastewater, broadband, and there's some stormwater projects that, that uh, sound like they're gonna be eligible too. So this will be evolving. There's more guidance coming, it sounds like in the next week or two from, from the treasury department. Um, so even the, the interim rules we've got um, aren't full rules at this point. And then it looks like it might be um, in two, payments to 50% payments, one, one in June, and then one sort of about six months later. Um, they've tied that to unemployment rates, and I just couldn't quite tease out if we're at or, um, you know, we've seen a net increase in the unemployment rate of more than two percentage points from February 2020. Um, in a quick, quick look, I couldn't determine that. So if, if it's more than that, we'll get 100% in the one payment. If it's less than that, it'll be the two 50% payments. So it'll be about 200 and 
26, 27,000 for each of those. So, so the money's coming. Um, we've started. We've got some of the guidelines. We can start to to think about the what's and the hows and and the where's. Um, but we've still got a long, I think, a long way to go before we fully understand mm -hmm. some of those parameters. Um, yeah. And then the state's yeah. having its conversation, and, and there's quite a bit of talk about the the different elements. Um, and there are webinars that the LCT is doing. We've got one coming up next week with uh, the National League of Cities is one of the presenters, and they've been a good source of information throughout. Um, and so I'm planning to to attend that and can send that link to anyone else who's interested. Um, but that's a, a really quick thumbnail sketch. Yeah, you've sussed that out really well, um, Trevor. Thanks. I I happen to be writing about this topic a fair amount for the for some of the freelance writing that I'm doing and. Um, all I've been able to discern with that 121 million that's going to the counties is that it's going to be allocated by some kind of a population formula, at least at this juncture. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, work, and if that's a case, that, that could, yeah, if you just did a straight per capita and applied it by town population, that'd be quite a boost in funding from that 453, but. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's still subject to the same, I think, um, same guidelines. Mm -hmm. And there are all other kinds of other pockets of money. So even if the direct uh, direct aid isn't something we can put to certain uses, there might be other buckets that are out there that that where something would be eligible. So, so how was the 453 determined? Um, the, Vermont Business Magazine had a map in its latest issue. Uh, a point and click map for every town in Vermont and it showed what their estimated allocation was and Randolph's read 450 but I'm just curious uh, how did they arrive at that figure? Uh, how, yeah, how did Congress arrive at, a, at that figure? Yeah I mean Treasurer yeah I, I don't know the full methodology yeah. um, at this point um, NL the National League of Cities has kept a calendar up all along that mm -hmm. pulls from whatever that that background yeah. formula yeah. is. I just yeah. I'm not sure yeah. what they're basing it on, um, mm -hmm. it, and how they've sort of split out the the entitlement units. You know, the bigger the Burlingtons and end up through the major cities, how they've split them out from from you yeah. know the majority of, of the smaller places. Yeah, and, and if yeah. it's a different formula, yeah, because of that or the same or uh, it's a good mm -hmm. question. I just don't I don't know if Tom. Yeah, had. I I I've been trying to parse it out. A quick, quick calculation seems to indicate that if that 120 million was allocated per capita, we'd be looking at close to $900,000. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we could be, you know, that's an area on, on the 1.3 with, um, and we'll probably have to get creative in deployment based on the guidelines unless they change. Um, would, 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 is that money going to be subject to the same restrictions that that this other direct money to the towns is subject to? That's the presumption. That's how I'm reading the interim rule is that it's applicable to all entitlement and non-entitlement categories, but it would be a good one to verify. Um, obviously, uh, more flexibility and a broader use of funds is a little bit easier to put in the field. Um, but if it's under the same set of guidelines, it might be that we, we've, we're gonna have to get pretty creative, I think, with some of these things. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, just, it's a it's just, a good problem to have. Oh, oh yeah, no, no complaining yeah. here. Uh, uh, just, um, just in in terms of you know what what was on the list you know of of potential needs that could be funded, it seems like you know our our you know our big area would be water and 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 wastewater perhaps. The uh, problem with that, Larry, is it's coming to the town. Mm -hmm. So the folks that aren't part of the water wastewater district are not going to like that very well. Right, but we might not have other places to put it. Well, we have uh, personnel. If we had positions that were vacant by, uh, I think it's the first part of March, then hiring people into those positions is eligible. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of stormwater projects that are on the list. We have uh, revenue replacement. So I believe that goes to um, 
any expectations of funding we had where we came in below. So if the pool usage was lower than we expected, if mm. um, you know any of our revenue generators from property tax we didn't receive from um, you know whatever. Mm -hmm. So if we look at what we expected versus got, that's eligible. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of things other than water, wastewater, or broadband okay. that are eligible. Oh, I, under that. Yeah, I think yeah, we've got to look at the full gamut to say kind of what does this what does this look like? Yeah, yeah, no, that's really interesting. That that that's 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 great that we'll be able to access funds to do all those all those things. Those will add up quite, to quite a bit. Yeah, so my take on this is, yeah, well, my take is don't be in a hurry to spend the money, okay? Because I guarantee you, just like PPP, the rules will change as we keep moving forward, <laughs> yep. okay? Yep. So I'm no hurry. That, my feeling is put it in a bank and sit on it for six months and see what happens. Yeah, but the yeah. most flexibility we're going to have is if it's for revenue replacement or if we use it to fund positions that were vacant on the magic day, because I believe yeah, we that's... have highway positions, we have uh, Emery's position as the assistant, Trevor's position, a bunch of those are eligible and they're eligible for more than a year's salary, so you know, that gives us the most flexibility with the funds that we would have budgeted for that. We can't use it for a tax break. They're pretty clear with that. In no, the absolutely not, no. Um, and that's all fine, but like I said, I, you know, let's, I'm interested in sitting around here for a while and wait and see what comes out of this because the rules yeah. will change. All right, yeah. let's keep that's the LCT's advice too, but more or less is to hang on to it for a bit and keep it safe and, and wait and see what shakes out. Yeah, yeah. All right, water and wastewater allocation. So I think I'm going to handle this one for you tonight. Um, the essentially what this one is, and, and Pat being involved with AR, AR, ACDC. That is okay. uh, that's quite a bit to get out. Um, there, there's a, a, the project of the Randolph House. One of the things they want to do is move the, the there are some water wastewater lines that currently would um, kind of cut behind the building on a diagonal. If they put the addition on and um, didn't move those lines, they would cut directly through the addition. So one of the things they've got to do is replace them and kind of move them around the outside of it. If they do that, the old easement that we'd have for the old lines would also run right through the addition. So it's a sort of a two part, the allowance to move the lines around where they want to build the addition um, and then making sure that we get a new easement that's about 30 feet in width, I think is what the target is, um, that would reflect where the new lines have gone in so that we can access them to make any repairs, replacements, any of those things. So there's the two pieces, um, you know, approving the relocation of, of the sewer main in this case. Um, and then uh, making that contingent on the proper easement documentation, which is what the advisory committee did. Uh, we had hoped to have the easement language um, for this, and um, but uh, it doesn't. I didn't uh, see that um, at some point um, along the way. So we're still waiting on that. So there's sort of two options, which is to to approve it. Um, to approve the relocation, but condition it upon the, the submission of a satisfactory easement. Really, what we're just looking to do is record where it's going to go, or you could um, hold it until the easement's ready, but that might have some project impacts based on their schedule. Um, that was part of why I think they, they were looking to, to get onto the advisory committee when they did, and then hit this project um, marker as well. Should be pretty straightforward. I think that the language will, will look a lot like it, uh, it does existing, except reflect the new location but get that recorded in the land records etc and so forth so um, those, those are the pieces there um, to, to consider it looks like larry's committee approved it yep also yep. so uh any concerns with this no it it, uh, it seems like a very straightforward um as as trevor was saying a very straightforward project um it's really just a matter of getting the the easement moved along with the the pipe and 
and they're going to take care of it all. There's not going to be any cost or impact to the town. And it, it's, it seems like a, a, just a, you know, a little hurdle that they need to go through to, to get this, this project moving. So um, the, the water wastewater committee was, was quite comfortable with, uh, with approving this, this request. That sounds like an upgrade too, doesn't it? To what's there now. Yeah. Yeah. Now, is that the same area that there was an issue a couple of years ago? It was the line that went down over there, wasn't it? In relation to Faye Sherman and so forth? I don't know. You got me with that one. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm wondering if Trini remembers that. No, Faye Sherman's was up on, wasn't in that area. It was at one point. There was an issue because he owned Gary Tallman's building. Maybe it was more than a few years ago. Maybe. But there was, I think the line at that point, maybe they said the line was in bad shape and we were going to have to replace it anyway at some point. But. I also want to say I'm on the RACDC board. As as am I. <laughs> so. So you guys can't make the motion. <laughs> I'll make the motion. To, I'll make the motion to approve the uh, relocation of the sewer main for RACDC. Contingent upon. With, with, con, con, right, contingent upon those little pieces that Trevor just spoke about, like. Satisfied, satisfactory. Yeah, easement. yes. Satisfied, right, exactly. Satisfied the easement pieces. Okay. Trevor's got the right language. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> and we, we got it. We got you. All right, good. You got me covered. Yeah. I'll second that. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Owen? Yep. Motion carries. Staffing needs. So this was placed on in part by request and, um, and we just broadened it so we could talk holistically if folks wanted to. Um, the, the original context was related to the part-time recreation position uh, and whether or not to, to consider moving that from part to full-time. Um, and then some of just the broader context, we've touched on a little bit with the ARPA funding where we've got some, some vacancies or some combined positions um, that are some, some areas of need um, and opportunity. And so just wanted to, to put it on to kind of queue up a conversation to see where folks are at, um, what type of information you need, um, what would be helpful in um, shaping the conversation and or moving it along. Heidi's on here and can speak more specifically to to some of the recreation related pieces and then um, Cliff's still hanging in there if there's some sort of broad questions about um, potential financial impacts. But really what we're, we're looking for is some sort of um, initial conversation about uh, um, some of these staffing needs in totality um, with some specifics to try to figure out what you need to, to continue that conversation both for, for the, the near term and the long term, you know, thinking ahead to um, fiscal 23 budget and all of that as well. Um, and this is uh, under the context that we're still trying to fill, um, like I mentioned, the open positions, the executive assistant that's also had a zoning component. Um, having the zoning component embedded with another position is, is part of that longer term st staffing conversation. Um, and then we're still working to fill one of the two highway buildings and grounds positions. Um, so if anybody's listening and is interested in, in that type of work, uh, you know, give us give us a holler. But um, uh, so we've got a few openings too that have, have um, you know complicated. Uh, you know everybody's wearing more than one hat and doing what they can to to pull what they can for weight. And um, but at some point we'll have to address some of these needs, either through hiring or or, or reimagining or whatever it might be. So we recently brought on or approve the part-time position to help in recreation. And then we also changed our highway and grounds positions because we had excess resources in the highway during the summertime, but needed resources over on the ground side. And part of that was to help with 
uh, setting up the, the different areas in the rec program. And I'm not sure that we've let that play out yet. Um, all right, because we just hired the first of those positions. The second one is still looking for the right candidate. Um, what so with the position and a half for admin and running the programs, what are the additional needs of the program that bring it to looking for another halftime position plus the resources from the grounds department? Heidi might be muted. Is that for me? Yeah. yeah, I think that's you, Heidi. Um, the the part-time coordinator is part-time and it's only able to be in the afternoons. So a part-time worker has another job. And so balancing two different jobs and being able to work only at night. So for example, in the ice rink, um, Grounds had another part uh, full-time and it was shared with water. And so anytime we had a storm, um, we had nobody to help us plow the ice rink. They got done by 2.30 and so that's when we opened. And so there's not enough help during the day. And so then my part-time workers who are usually are for the nighttime, when ice rink is open or the pool and all that, um, we couldn't use that time. I mean, and our staff is not trained to plow or stuff like that. So it's really kind of hard to share those kind of resources. Um, this year, I ended up being the one shoveling all winter long um, because I didn't have a person really to, to help me at all. So not only did I do have to do my admin and everything, but I also had to shovel and, and ice the ice rink because Browns had a duty for you know plowing and all that, which I understand. And then my part-time staff is there working when the ice rink is open. So what you need is somebody that's going to help with the shoveling and uh, yeah. prep work of the ice rink in the winter? In the winter, yeah, that's, it goes with that. It goes with youth sports, you know, um, youth um, basketballs in the winter as well, which, which is only on, on the weekends and nights. Um, in the summertime, we have, you know, from right now to baseball that I, you know, I was umping the game. I ran over here to be on the call too, um, to all the summer in the pool and camps which camps start at 7.30 in the morning. They won't end until like some of them at six o'clock at night. But you have a variety of temps that come on also, correct? Yeah. That help with the summer camps and the ice rink and those things. Are all the temps <laughs> only available to help nights? They're all, they're all part, they're all part <coughs> time. And out of all of those, um, I only have really one adult um, that is not in college. Um, the majority of them are all in college. Well, the like 50% in college and the rest of them are juniors and in, in, um, seniors in high school. So sometimes like that, I, they don't, they, I can't have a high school kid closing up the ice rink or, or a pool. When there's money transactions, there's, I mean, on a good day, but we need an adult really to supervise. So is it a matter of who's being selected in the part-time positions or in the summer, you know, in the year round? Yeah, that's, it's a very hard position if, you know, for adults, I mean, a part-time position is very hard to fill. I'm, uh, I've been fortunate to have a part-time, he's a teacher, um, and uh, he's a part-time teacher to para, and therefore he is available at night um, and then during the summer. But usually a capable adult in the rec course, you know, in the recreation profession, 
I mean, they're looking for full time. It's really hard to find a person, you know, part time other than kids. Well, actually, in the part time workforce, we're seeing a lot of parents um, and whatnot. And so I think that'll open up more when the kids go back to school with folks that are available. But I, how many employees do you have at any one time? Um, during the winter, I only have like four or five um, in, the, in the ice rink. And there's a few of basketball officials that only work like two or three hours on the Saturday. Um, in the summertime, camp averages about eight to nine counselors. Um, and that's a range from a manager to lead staff to kids, I mean, uh, to high school. Um, and then the pool, we have a pool manager and um, the rest are lifeguards, which are about eight, eight kids. So, um, well, Heidi, you're validating my reason for wanting to cover that skating ring with a big tent. There's nothing <laughs> like skating underneath the, the stars. I know. I know you keep <laughs> saying that, but you're telling me you don't have enough people to shovel it. And, well, you know, regardless I, I, of shoveling, it's fine. <laughs> you're just, you're just, all you're doing is making my case that that skating ring should be covered for multiple purposes. And, you know, it's not that expensive. So, anyways, uh, I think my thought here is, is maybe you, I'd like to see you work with Trevor here because I think, you know, if there's more resources that you need to do some of those things and we have B and G people, um, I'm not sure where they're getting utilized, but I'd love Trevor to weigh in on this and figure out how, you know, some of the folks that are, you know, mowing the lawns and taking care of cemeteries in the summertime, and I'm sure it'd be utilized to do sidewalks could be more rooted into maybe we need another full-time person who floats around to do some of this stuff. Um, I'm not opposed to thinking that you need another assistant or a full or, or a position here, but I think I'd love to see how um, Trevor could maybe figure out how to utilize. I mean, because, you know, you're not, we're not going to pay somebody and a, a salary to be, an, you know, to be a, an assistant for you that's going to be down there shoveling to me that's like that's the wrong thing to no be no but it, it's, it's like the daily use the daily work like right now i have to prep the pool and it's just kind no, of I, me right now prepping <clears throat> the pool so i'm gonna have to go because harold does not have the manpower uh claude does hey, certain things but then and I that's have to what go and pressure wash the entire pool and um, because i want it ready to be open and there's tons right, of that, that's too. that's my point my point is that you know those to me that seems like that's not you know that's not an assistant that should be doing that stuff it's more of a you know a being ground a building a grounds person or maybe you know a person is maybe three quarters dedicated to the rec department to deal with some of these issues versus um you know and it's kind of like an executive assistant position so I'm, I'm a little confused about what you need here so that's why i'm trying to get a little clarity on this well a, a person that well that's what i'm trying to clarify a person that can do the day-to-day -day stuff um there's a lot of prep work that happens at the camp you know cleaning right now moving things around i'm like a moving company you know moving from one thing to another and right now it's just me you know i could hire a kid but it's just kind of organizing camp and opening the pool and then we have to do that with the ice rink and then close the ice rink we have to prep for events you know we, we're, there's there's tons of stuff that um, it does seem like grounds work, but it's also rec work, recreation. Like right now, prepping the fields for baseball, um, you know, getting the gym ready with all that stuff. That's all rec rec stuff. So it's not if unless you know about recreation, about youth sports or specific pool and camp stuff, it's kind of hard to just put somebody in there. So Heidi, this seems to me like you need a, a list of tasks, like what has to be done. And then when you're looking at those tasks, if it's prepping the field for baseball, buildings and grounds could do that. Washing the pool to get it ready to open, buildings and grounds should be doing that. We just went through and went 
um, met with the union and whatnot and got approved these positions that are split so that more resources can in the summertime shift over to help with those type of activities and some of the stuff that Harold needs. And then in the winter time, when more of the road work, uh, winter maintenance is labor intensive, they can switch over there to help with that side. So I think Perry's right that this needs to go towards a better definition of what the duties are that need to be done and then looking at what part of town government should be doing those. Cause you're right, you shouldn't be down there pressure washing, but you've got to give that task list over to buildings and grounds that says, you know, by June 1st, the pool needs to be ready to be opened. And these are the tasks I need somebody to do to be able to open it. And I, and I agree, uh, Trini, and it's, um, they don't have the personnel and they're, they're not doing it. And so I don't know how to help them or they don't have the staff, you know? And they do have the staff and we've given them the positions and they just hired one person. They got another one that they're about to hire. But I think this comes back. We don't just hire more people because somebody's not doing their job. We go and revisit what those job duties are and what somebody's supposed to be doing and we address poor performance or we address why something's not happening. We don't just hire more staff. No, I, I agree. And uh, well, we also, but also, it also it can't happen in the morning at 6 a.m. and then leave at 2. A lot oh, no, of I, I, our stuff happens, you know, later on in the afternoon. I think and, the key word here is coordination. And communication. So, yeah, I think those are the two, the two words here that, that I think that, you know, if we need to hire another person, you know, to, to be in those positions and, and they're working at building the grounds and they're also helping you, that's why I think it's um, important to kind of, as Trini said, you know, let's look, f figure out what the tasks are. And, you know, if you have, basically you create a work order and say, I need the pool cleaned by X date and we need to pass that off to building the grounds. I don't necessarily think that's a, a recreation department piece, so to speak, that because there is a different level of skills required to do some of these things. So in my mind, you know, B and G maybe picks up some of that stuff and uh, you're, you're not focusing so much on that. I'm, I think I'd love for Trevor to weigh in on this. I, I think Heidi's touched on some of it with, with Harold and his crew is just, um, we've got sort of uh, three reliably um, out in the, uh, in the field, so to speak, on any given day, and sometimes augmented by by that fourth. Um, and right now, they're just trying to figure out how to handle the burials after after winter um, and anything that's been scheduled. Um, keep up with mowing and cemeteries, handle any of some of these other needs. So it's it's a little bit of um, you know they're spread out as well. But I do think I do wonder, I should say, if um, there's that open position that maybe that can be reimagined a little bit. Um, to hit some of these needs. Um, it's just been hard to find applicants for whatever reason. Um, it's been a very shallow pool of candidates. And so we may have to, to get creative and go some places, um, you know, a little more proactively to try to seek out anybody who could handle um, some of these positions. And maybe we try to fill that open one and see if we can steal that for some of this capacity um, and, and talk about schedule and some of those other, um, I keep using the phrase reimagine it, but, but sort of rethink um, how that one position shaped a little bit, at least for the summer, to provide some of that capacity. And that fits within the existing budget slot, basically. Um, it's just the trick's going to be finding somebody who who um, who can step in and, and do that sooner than later, because um, we're just we're just not seeing candidates for for any of the positions we've got open or have advertised. So it's it's um, it's one of those markets. So that that's not to say that we we can. It's just. Um, that's the stew of, of factors that goes into it. Um, so I'm, so I think, I'm sorry, Heidi, go ahead. I just want to add one thing. And also to have experience with a with a pool. You know, once Claude retires and he does things in his own way, but no one in the buildings and grounds other than me that has a certificate of uh, pool operator, that is a... I mean, we have, we fixed, we have spent so much money fixing that pool. And if we don't have qualified people to actually know what to do with that pool or the ice rink, you know, it doesn't help us. 
But some of that's the communication side. So if we need to send somebody to have them trained on how to do certain things, that's investing in our employees to build that flexibility into them. And the other thing that may be time to look at, Trevor, is up until maybe, I'm going to guess, but maybe about six years ago, we hired the mowing of the cemeteries done. Mm -hmm. And that was brought in-house um, and we made some of the buildings and grounds people full-time instead of part-time and got rid of the contractor. We had a lot of problems with the contractor and there was a lot of complaints which led up to that, but it may be time to start thinking outside the box that way too, where an employee may not be the answer, but contracting some of this work might be the answer. Yeah, and with that, you might be able to divide up certain places. So maybe you, you know, you have a crew that takes care of a certain part of it, but maybe you sub out the rest of it. Yeah. So it's certainly not something we're going to solve tonight, but I think it requires a little bit more in-depth discussion and, and some uh, out-of-the-box thinking to see what, uh, what we can do to uh, solve all those little problems. And, and right now, you know, as somebody who needs a lot of labor, you're going to struggle with that for another six months at least. It's just not, there's nobody out there really wants to work. So unfortunately, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's going to take a little while for that to shake it out of the system. Yeah, and I, I hope they don't lose the staff that I have. You know, I have capable staff, and hopefully that would have been good would be full time. Um, you know, then we have to start over. Um, I hope I hear. Out. I hear you. I know all about losing staff. Let me tell you. So yeah, it's, 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 just, it's, it's just a lot and uh, we'll see how much we survive. <laughs> yeah, that's all you can do. So just try to keep them happy and uh, go from there. It, sound, it sounds like there's some, some open positions right now in buildings and grounds. Is that what correct? Is that what I'm hearing? It's there, one combined. One. Yep. Yeah, so one combined. One combined position, right? Uh, it's buildings highway hybrid. I see. So yeah, meant to be yeah buildings warmer months. I suppose you think of them in, in highways the, the colder months. But they can come over in the winter months too, Larry. The intent with those positions was we had more highway staff than we needed in the off peak times. Right. And the off peak times seemed to match really well with when buildings and grounds had peak times. Mm -hmm. So instead of having staff that stood around and we were trying to make work for them, we kind of changed the job spec, yep. got it through the union. So they were able to bounce back and forth between the two areas on a, on a need basis. That doesn't mean that we don't have somebody in the winter time that could be plowing for a certain span of time and then over helping open up the rink. Right. So we haven't said they're from day X to Z, they're in buildings and grounds and from Z to Y, they're in highway. It's the position is written so they can go back and forth according to what the needs are of the two parts of the town. Mm -hmm. And are there, is there one position that's already doing that and then there's one that's vacant? Correct. Okay, just wanted to get clear on what that, what that situation is. Yep. So we also have um, two, we have uh, the, the assistant to Trevor and um, the request to uh, move zoning out of Josh's position to that position was what the uh, original request was. Yeah, I, I think um, you know some of this. We'll, we'll try to fill the the hybrid where it's an executive assistant, um, uh, assistant zoning administrator um, in in the short term, and then. But I think long term, there's there's that. I mean, you may have had this conversation already. It's about whether or not zoning should be embedded in any other office or be a standalone regulatory function, and that would let the executive assistant kind of go back to, to um, you know, being the real nerve center uh, in a lot of ways of of what we're doing here. 
Um, so those are those are key roles that, that are unfilled in, in some form right now. Obviously, Josh is doing the zoning piece, so it's not an, an, an unfilled. Um, but it's also you know one of those things that takes a certain amount of time, and that's time he's not spent on on the tasks or, or the job that was envisioned um, for that position. And then it's um, you know just today was a good example of um, trying to cover this role and and cover that one as well. So I've been everywhere from here with you folks to Beanville Road to um, submitting COBRA enrollment forms to uh, Cliff brought me 400 excess weight permits um, to work through. Um, and so it's, you know, it's starting to pull much like with Heidi's, um, you know, had relay to it. You, you leave some of these things open, it really starts to, to pull you out a little bit and, and um, you do what you can to get through, but those are things we need to, to try to fill. Um, sooner than later, but again, it's 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 um, there's been a real dearth of candidates. So I'm gonna um, you know try to think creatively and, and see if we can entice somebody from um, from somewhere a little different. You know, sort of try to uh, upsell the job description in a lot of ways, um, and uh, and and try to just see if we can see what we can turn over. But um, you know, so we're we're just a little a little short in a few different areas. Um, some of which are in the budget, and some of which we just got to figure out the right people to fill, fill the roles. But um, you know, the zoning question is a, I think, a longer-term one, especially if we can add some, some supplemental capacity in that hybrid position. But but long-term, it may make some sense. Um, again, it'll depend on workload, tasks, individuals, um, and where we land. But uh, you know, a more traditional, I guess, framework when you think of, of how municipal offices are set up. But but those those are out there as well as as um, capacity concerns. So zoning, we've never had a uh, workload to fill the entire position. We've never had, um, <clears throat> there's not enough, <clears throat> excuse me, work there to fill a 40 hour week. Um, Marty skills, when she was here, she was the town engineer. She was the tree warden. She was the sign warden. Uh, she did zoning. There was, you know, she had a whole variety of things. And then I think she was only three quarters of a position with all those tasks. So that's kind of why the thought was if you had somebody who could help with uh, some projects and some of the grants and those type of activities to help the town manager, those skills are pretty much the same as what's required to process zoning permits and whatnot. That's uh, kind of how we started looking at that being a full-time job so you could potentially attract somebody because there would be full-time work and benefits and and those type of things that went along with it but <clears throat> i think we've got a couple of uh it's kind of two different facets there but kind of similar work um hmm. i would like to add to that i do think that Given the situation and the amount of property that's changed hands in the last year and probably will for the foreseeable future, I'm a little concerned about, you know, the zoning department or Josh becoming overwhelmed with, you know, applications for things like porches and garages and those kind of things. And, you know, I think his workload could increase. And I think it's a, I don't think it's a good use of his time. Uh, to be dealing with those kind of things when really I think there's also going to be opportunities for him to be working on grants and stuff for economic development. So that's my concern is I think we need to kind of like lessen his his uh, role and the amount of hours he's spending dealing with zoning issues right now. Um, and so I'm just hopeful that we can change that relatively soon here. One of the conversations that I thought might be nice to revisit that I guess popped up a couple of years ago and, and it models a little bit what, what we've tried in other places I've been is that if say we've got somewhere in that 20 to 24 hour a week zoning capacity, maybe there's a neighboring community that has a similar part time need and maybe we can cobble together some kind of um, position that's more attractive to an applicant but better fits sort of what our workload is, um, but the person knows that they've got X number of hours and I don't know. It, I think it was Braintree and and Brookfield. Maybe were part of that conversation at one point. I don't know if they're they're still potential partners. But um, we did that in 
in Hinesburg where we took it and, and shared it with Richmond for a while. And, and Richmond, I think now shares it with Huntington, um, which makes some sense given their, their proximity, they share a border. Um, but I don't know if there's a model like that that helps as well to get some of that dedicated zoning capacity, um, but sort of reflects that it may not be um, you know, something that's, that's 40 hours of need each week. Um, but that, that's sort of a longer term. I don't know, that's not one we're gonna sort of fix in the next month or so. That might be, a, you know, take some, take some time to, to build to that. Right, and, and there's some seasonality to this. Mm -hmm. You know, when you get into spring, people are starting to think about projects. And so I'm sure, you know, the, the need for, you know, zoning administration type conversations are gonna happen a lot more, you know, during, those, during that summer period when people are looking at construction projects. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I mean, when Josh took this, it was, you know, it was kind of a, at the time, it seemed like the right thing to do. But as I talked to him a couple of times, it seems like, you know, he's becoming a little bit more overwhelmed with some of this stuff. And I just personally think that we hired him for economic development and we really kind of need to get back to that. Are we advertising <laughs> for the executive assistant now? We, we've got to revise, yeah, and go back out and, and, and try to put that in some of the, the, the key spots. It's not active, I think, anywhere, but maybe our website. Um, so getting that back out into some of the VLCT and into other local spaces is a, is a next step. And then um, sort of thinking about if there's anybody, entity or organization to directly um, kind of supply it to. Um, in a lot of ways, that, that position could be a really cool entry point for someone who who's interested in local government and it's maybe coming through you know an mpa program for example and it's not someone we're going to keep for a long time in that case but um, if you've got a couple of years of that kind of capacity um, where they're learning all the aspects that that might make it pretty intriguing to somebody who's who's got a longer timeline and so we'll, we'll even try to work those angles as well to see uh, if maybe that's that's a possibility um, that's that's how i started in a lot of ways was through it was a spe specific program but it had a lot of those elements to it uh, mm -hmm. that that position would do and that's going after an assistant for you and a zoning function how are yeah, we might that? we might leave it as that combination and then sort of sell the fact that you get to do the two pieces as your sort of advanced extra education and local government um, if you're interested in that or, or at a minimum we'll, we'll scare them away entirely from the experience and um, <laughs> free them up to pursue other interests. <laughs> but hopefully, hopefully we won't scare and scar. They'll, they'll, they'll go on. But um, yeah, but the idea would be that might be a way to, to, um, you know, to make the, the, the combination a little more attractive to a candidate who, and you might have somebody out there who's thinking, well, I'd like to do the zoning piece. I don't want to do the other piece or vice versa. Whereas this might say, well, I, I get to learn it all. Um, and maybe that's something that, that shakes a candidate out of a tree, for example. It's all in the marketing, right? <laughs> it, yeah, right. we're going to make it sound so cool. That, um, well, just how can you, you can take the cans back on Saturday or you can be a recycling engineer. It's all in how you write it. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. So moving ahead, we have grants on EPA Region 1 Help Communities Grant Application. Yeah, this is one uh, Adolfo identified um, toward the end of his tenure. Um, it's a smaller dollar grant and that their max awards of $30,000. The deadline to apply is coming up um, about a week from today. Um, they're through the EPA, one of the potential funding um, areas are water projects like the one we've got upcoming. Um, they try to have them targeted to, um, you know, I don't know if you want to call them at-risk populations or vulnerable populations. Um, and they define some of them as uh, if you've got an elderly population or, or children or, or um, some other environmental related concerns uh, on top of that or, or, or instead of. Um, so it's, it's, it's a modest grant. Um, it's not a perfect match in terms of if you think of funding sources, but it, it is one of those sources. And I, and I think the conversation has been that it'd be this continued um, uh, attempt to try to find funding, alternative funding sources before we got into to the SRF program. So this, this is one of those that's out there. 
Um, but if you and if you want us to apply, we can do that. Um, modest amount, modest match, fifteen hundred bucks. So, um, and it, it might be a long shot based on some of the program um, explanations and guidelines, but it, you you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. So. Any questions on that grant? Not a motion to authorize the application. I'll move to authorize the application. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Staying. Motion carries. Summer Mater's grant application. I don't. I don't know if this is. I'm trying to look through my. List here and see if Amy's on. I don't know if anybody's still on from the. Um, uh, so we're know. doing the recreation grant first. The paperwork has the library one first, but the agenda has the rec one. Yeah. This is an application that's already been submitted. Summer yeah. matters for all. Right? Yeah. I had my sheet backwards. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, this is the summer matters for all. This is, I think it was alluded to in the, the back in the public comment as well that this was a grant application that was out there um, and has uh, $22,730 for there's four different uses um, high school students to support camp counselors I'm guessing it says four high students but I'm thinking we want high schoolers um, <laughs> contract guest artists hire a tent for additional space and add a drop-in program for tweens and teens at the library and those all total up to the 22730 uh, most of it's for the high school students um, in the support roles about a little less than 13,000 so this is essentially proving retroactively what they've applied for and some of this with the, the covid money in this area it seems like grants get announced and the timelines are, are set you know deadlines are set not that long after and they fall in between sort of the normal approval timelines and, and i think these two grants were were examples of that if i remember right all right. Uh, anybody want to make a motion to approve the application for that grant? I'll make a motion we approve the application for the Summer Matters for All grant. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained. Motion carries. Next up is the Amplify Vermont grant, which is another grant that was applied for and received actually by the library. Yoga program. It's the four I session would, yoga program. I would move to approve uh, submission and acceptance of that grant. Amplify grant. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Abstained. Motion carries. Old business appointments two committees we've got three potential appointments um i think if jeff is hung on there with us yeah i see his name so jeff grout seeking position on the energy advisory committee um it has the support of the committee chair and and other members who reached out um you had his letter of interest or an email of interest and a brief background in the packets and then there were two other well three other i guess when you think of the people um suzanne pickett whose name came up during the wastewater water advisory committee meeting as being uh, it'd be a new appointment though she served on that committee before and then there were two alternates to the development review board and these would be two planning commissioners um, who would who would serve as that Perry's one of them I believe um, and Sunny Holt is the other the idea is to ensure that the DRB has um, sufficient capacity from a quorum standpoint for some of the applications that are upcoming once you factor in vacancies and some of the planned recusals so that they can still carry out those functions by putting the, the alternates um, into action in, in some upcoming hearings. I think the Randolph House project might be, be one of the, the bigger examples of that. So, so those two volunteered um, to serve on that role and there's still some openings for regular positions, but um, the thought being alternates could step in and, and provide that capacity. So that's the full slate of, of, of candidates um for potential appointment for you okay anybody have any concern with any of the folks identified no. hearing none anybody want to make a motion to approve them 
I'll make the motion that we approve all the uh, all the appointments to the Energy Advisory Committee, the Wastewater Advisory Committee, and the Development Review Board as as stipulated. Becker. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Aye. Aye. We should be. I got that, Trevor. Right, I abstain. Yep. Yep. Four Thank zero you. one. Thank yep. you. Well, you can vote yourself on Perry. No, that's fine. Other <laughs> business. <laughs> Trini, we should be advertising for DRB. Are we doing that? If they're empty, if they're empty. Um, I believe there's a running list out there for vacancies on all the committees, Pat. Are we doing yeah. anything? In the paper or anything. We could probably stand for a, a, a fresh round of, of calls to action um, in a few different spots. Yeah. Okay. That's an important board. It's almost as thankless as the select board position, Pat. You just don't get paid. <laughs> it is almost important. as much heat. <laughs> as soon as we find some other alternate candidates, I'm resigning. <laughs> yeah, well, I served 20 years on that board and you don't even get very, enough. You don't get enough to buy Maalox, you mean? You get nothing. <laughs> you don't eat your own bottle of Tums. <laughs> a lot of respect. Not a lot of respect. Depends which side of the application you're on. That's true. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So other business. Or any other business, Trevor? No, I a few things under manager's report, but I can do them now if you just want to hear them real quick, just some sort of heads yep. up stuff. We'll move on, on to manager's report then. Yep. So just to kind of go quickly through these and then in future agendas, I hope to just put these in there somewhere as a, a written document so you have it ahead of time as well, in case you want to ask any questions or we want to add anything to it. Um, but the basic list is they, um, we finished hydrant flushing for this time of year. This is the first of the, the two times. The next time would be roughly in the fall, a little bit earlier than anticipated. Um, this was done at night. Um, so I don't know if anybody, I didn't catch any feedback, but I did hear there were there was at least one resident who was um, upset at the sound of, of, of a rushing hydrant um, in the early hours of the morning, but um, they finished that maintenance practice. Um, and so that that um, is part of this as we stepped these up, done these in these compact time frames, um, should help with the infrastructure, the water quality, all of those pieces. Um, the next thing up is uh, there's a sewer line project on on Central Street that's right by the Cumbies, so it's in um, uh, uh, a pretty heavily used location when you think of, of traffic patterns. Um, Morgan and, and Chris are thinking about that'll be a joint highway water wastewater department. Um, task they're thinking about doing that project at night because we have to open up it's a problem with our service we have to open up both sides of the road so we're gonna do a half a lane at a time but trying to do that manage traffic impacts all of those things it'll it'll be a little more effective and efficient to do it at night the problem is um, there'll be some extra noises for the folks who who live anywhere adjacent to that um, so I'll see if there's some way we can provide a little uh, advance notice but if for some reason you hear about that before um, we're able to do that. That's that's what's happening there. Um, North Randolph scoping study for the slope stabilization should go out soon. Um, up next after that, hopefully the paving bids. I'd like to get those close next week or the week after, um, if all goes well. Um, the the environmental assessment over at the chimney lots is going to start next week. That's why everything's been removed from there, and we'll. Um, you know, uh, uh, barricade the entrance points because uh, no one's supposed to be in there while that's going on. Um, so that piece is about to start. It also means that the Merchants Row project is, is pretty close to done. Um, they've got to plant the rain garden plantings. Those will be next week. And I think moving that stop sign is something that has come up a couple of times where, where it's, um, you know, kind of hanging out in the, in the traveled way right now. Um, and then we'll kind of wait and see what the governor says tomorrow in terms of uh, as we think about a reopening plan and what that looks like in the in the timing and see what the the, the updated guidance looks like but start to to move in that direction if for no other reason than thinking about the the july 4th targets that have been out there more broadly at the state and federal levels but 
we'll start to think about uh, about how to do that and, and and see if there's anything we need to do other than than unlock everything at that point depending on on um, where everything is and so those are sort of the basic things that are also out there which you may or may not get a call about or that folks have asked about um, so a brief list mm. Nice. Any questions for Trevor? If not, anybody want to take action on number 10? Nope, not yet. <laughs> I, have an, I have another business question, Trini. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. <laughs> I was going to say something, but Pat can go first. <laughs> um, have we made any progress on the East Randolph Community Hall assessment? Any? forward movement there at this point? So the bids came in more than double what the available funding was. Yeah. And the group has, um, we took a step back and looked at um, other ways of getting the information and what they needed. And so that's being broke down into smaller chunks of work. Um, and they're actually right now putting together a grant application to, which is going to uh, Senator Sanders' office um, that will, is looking for the full funding to do the entire project. So that's pretty much where that stands. Okay. And when would uh, we know about that grant? Do you know? I have not seen the completed information on it. I believe uh, the intent of that is through the earmarking process um, that they're doing. I believe that's what Sanders is looking to do with those applications. Um, so you're probably looking at a um, start of the federal fiscal year. If I had to guess, is when those yeah. funds would be there. Thank you. Well, that, that's a nice segue to what I was going to say in that um, there was an article in Vermont Digger the other day saying that uh, uh, Pat Leahy's office is also um, soliciting input for, for earmarks um, and that they're going to be accepting ideas until the end of May some point. And, um, and I'm wondering if that's another opportunity potentially for us um, that if we have a particularly attractive, you know, project that's on the, on the bigger side for us, um, that that might be something that we can um, look at what, what do we take to uh, get that in front of um, our other Senator. Actually, all three representatives have that opportunity I was told today. It's okay. been out there for a couple months, actually. Yeah, yeah. That's where we should be getting Josh on board. Either Leahy or Sanders would be good advocates for their position. Lee and Sanders certainly have the most clout. Chairs of their respective committees. Do you have anything in mind, Larry? Um, depending upon how, you know, we see some of the funding for the water and wastewater coming in, um, you know, that's a, we're still looking at like a million dollars, I think, for or close to it that we're that we're looking to borrow to to finish the reservoir project and get those wells online and we're already looking at um, fee increases for water and wastewater even independent I believe of of that project and and so you know given given the, the you know the fairly high cost of that service here already in Randolph I think it would be a, a real bit benefit to uh, the downtown you know where the where the district is. If if we can keep 
our, our rates under control. Um, really, really not looking forward to the discussions of how much we're going to raise our, um, our water, wastewater rates by, um, especially if uh, we're looking at some big bond payments. That's, that's sort of the thing which comes most readily to my mind, but I really brought it up as a, a to, to us here together as, a, as more of, you know, are there sort of big picture things that we wouldn't even necessarily even normally dream of because they're just, you know, out of the question, you know, because of the expense, but, you know, federal dollars are, uh, are, are, are pretty, pretty big and uh, it's not that hard to imagine you know, a, a project that, you know, say is hundreds of thousands of dollars or a million dollars that we would normally wouldn't even dream of, but uh, somebody looking at it from the federal level might be like, oh yeah, that's not that much money. We can do that. Just wanna make sure is we're- the water, at... Is the water oh. wastewater committee looking at Forwarding projects. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by forwarding projects, Trini. Like, uh, well, who's taking the lead on coming up with projects they would like to see put in for these earmarks? Is that the Water Wastewater Committee? Is that the staff? Um, yeah, right. Right now, I don't think there's anybody really thinking in, in those terms other than what our, you know, obvious needs are, which, which right now is really the, the reservoir and, and those wells. Um, after, I think that's where our, our highest priority is. And it, it seems like, you know, we're really focused on seeing that project through. And I don't see us really having a, you know, focusing on, on other projects until we've got that one well under its way. Is our capital budget committee identifying areas where investment in the water wastewater would make sense? Sounds like a question for Mr. French. Uh, they aren't at this point. I don't think they knew they were asked to do that. But okay, I want to say be careful here because yeah. you're talking about a separate district. You know, that's not the entire town. No, this is for uh, grants. Like if we're gonna apply for grants to do upgrades to the water wastewater district, um, you know, it seems like we need to get somebody focused on identifying where those priorities are and, and what should be in those grants. And so I'm just trying to fish out, like, is it the water wastewater committee? Is it the capital budget committee? Like who's overseeing what our priority is for investments? Because I think what Larry's talking about is uh, replacing some of this infrastructure, which is a little different than like installing new infrastructure. Like how do we come up with what that project looks like that we might put in? You know, there's a lot of federal money coming for for infrastructure investments. So and I've seen water wastewater listed in a lot of the uh, a lot of the different grant opportunities that are coming. They're going to be competitive, and so somewhere there needs to be a focus on what those projects are. You know, where is our highest need? What's our worst infrastructure? Um, where are we going to be looking at doing road projects in the next couple of years where underneath those road projects, we're going to want to replace all this water and sewer line. And what are we, you know, where are the best investments? And it's across the board. It's not just water, wastewater, but if we're going to go for grants specific to water, wastewater, who should be taking the lead on figuring out what those projects are? Yeah. How about for for the for the short term for the end of May, um, it might be it might be at a staff level we could take a, a list to trying to come you know a cracker trying to come up with a list uh, of ideas to at least get in that queue for this round, and it might provide a little bit of a baseline for development of some of these kind of broader bigger um, prioritization exercises. Um, and maybe we can kick off that process by 
by trying to take advantage of the, the earmark opportunities that are in front of us and, and pull together just a few different projects that have broad benefit. Um, you know, it might be the, the combination of water, wastewater road, you know, pedestrian bike pad infrastructure. Maybe there's a project with, with all of those components. So it's got broad benefit or has broad applicability to the community and, and that's something more specific. Um, it, it, and I think the ideas are out there that we can pull together to, to create some kind of list, but. Um, so we I, did the uh, mapping, right? Of where all our lines are uh, and whatnot. Did we do what the condition of them were when we did that effort? So we know where we've got this clay pipe versus newer material. Or did we just say there's a pipe here? I, I don't know the, the I have not seen that map. If um, I, do, I don't we know. We got a grant for it, right? Then we, we authorized a grant application for an acceptance of a grant within the last couple of years. I believe the RPC helped some with it. And the effort was to map. It was only one. Remember, we didn't do water and wastewater. We only were able to do, we only did one. You have a good memory, Trini. I don't remember. Yeah, that's, I was going to say that's before my time. No, it wasn't. It wasn't that long really? ago. Really? Um, well, I think it's more than three years. Yeah, it identified the challenge we had on Elm Street. Yeah, so that was just just prior to me coming on. I, I just I remember vaguely something about that, but I wasn't part of that conversation. So I don't know what got done. Yeah, they only were able to do one. The money that was out there was for only one. And I don't remember if it was water or wastewater. This may be something the the water sewer folks could help with Trevor, but one of them did get mapped. And, but I think what the, the challenge is, is like, what's our inventory, right? So how many, you know, what do we have out there for pipe that is gonna fail any day? And, you know, this, there was, um, a few years ago, we had the challenge where some of the water pipes weren't actually six feet deep. I mean, they all froze and we were putting um, supply tanks for people in their homes um, because their lines yeah. were frozen. Yeah, I remember that. That was probably remember five or this? six years ago. Yeah, it was in that same time period, kind of. And uh, you know, we had yeah, there uh, was a, three different really contractors trying to thaw lines yeah yeah that was I want, i'm saying that was at least five to six years ago because i remember i i was involved in that we had to run a garden hose from our apartment house over to the next house because their line froze and there was like everything yes. up and down yeah that was probably five to six years yeah. ago yeah and so it was right after that whole thing that the uh inventory was done on one of them It's out there, but that's a piece of data that would probably help define possibly kind of the somewhere we must know the age of some of this stuff. Um, but I would think where our where our capital budget committee is showing we need to make investment in roads, if they're within the water sewer district, those are areas that we should be targeting um, because that's the time to replace water sewer lines. Um, and then that brings you your much better rounded project to put forward if you're doing everything. Um, and the other thing uh, that probably is going to surface here somewhere is um, that conversation keeps getting hinted to in Randolph Center where they have their own water district. They run it totally separate from the towns, but about all of their lines are ready to fail. And every now and then you hear them bring up, well, doesn't the town want to take on our water system? And to which our answer is usually, yeah, no. Um, but, you know, that is infrastructure. It is part of, it's in the town. You know, is there, is there kind of a 
project that could be put forward where it does become part of the town system, but at the same time, there's a grant that updates all the infrastructure before the town takes ownership. I don't know what the answer to that is, but if we're talking water, wastewater infrastructure, probably this is the time we're going to see the biggest investment coming out of it with non taxpayer dollars, you know, well, non locally raised taxpayer dollars, it's all taxpayer dollars, but it's not going to hit our, you know, property taxes high. But. Right. So for Trevor's information, the Randolph Center Water District is a combination of 50 households in Randolph Center and Vermont Technical College, they share the system. So uh, it's complex. But it's headed for a very high bill to replace the infrastructure. Oh, well, they had their opportunity. I know, I know, but <coughs> it's out there. It's Perry, you can't let that comment go without a little more detail. <laughs> uh, in a private conversation, Larry. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Um, the only other thought I have about all this is, you know, with all the potential opportunities um, coming in between ARPA, um, this new infrastructure bill, which is, um, you know, apparently going to happen at, at, at some point in the near future, um, and, um, and with, you know, money that might be available through um, this earmark process, it just, it just seems like we need to be um, thinking about those things all together and, and what our strategy is. Um, to really make the, the most of whatever possibilities, uh, opportunities that we have. Um, I don't really know what that looks like, but it does seem like we should be thinking of this as, you know, sort of holistically and, you know, putting our, you know, maybe certain projects are, are better at, you know, are going to be more amenable to a particular, you know, pot of money that we'd be more likely to get it through one place and another. And we can, you know, sort of, you know, be just be very strategic about how we go about, you know, looking through these, you know, looking for these opportunities. And timing. I'm sorry, which, Pat? I said and timing, which project. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Projects take a while, so time so that you can spread them out and work on all of them. Good idea, Larry. Sounds like Trevor is willing to start that. Get that going. Um, with an eye toward, you know, May is sort of the first marker, but it does set up that longer planning uh, conversation document, you know, puts us in a better spot to, to take advantage of some of these potential opportunities. So Montpelier, might, I'm going to steal it. My wife was talking about they've got a hundred year water wastewater plan. Um, so see if we can steal a copy of that as an example of, of how you can at least organize um, different replacements and tie it to some of the other elements and, and just see from, from formatting and, and some of those other things. So we might have a template we can easily borrow and amend. That sounds great. Any more comments on any of that? Thoughts? People volunteering to help with the lift? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm willing to to help out as as I can. Um, I'm not quite sure what that would look like, but if if Trevor has ideas of how I might be able to work with him, um, that's I'm 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 going to be there. The legislature is wrapping up in the next week, and I will be um, looking for projects. I'm hearing you're going back in June, though. Oh, well, we'll see. It depends on what the governor does. Yeah. <laughs> you're going back in June. <laughs> uh -huh. All right. Yeah. Uh, any other topics? So negative. On that topic, uh, we, we can all submit. No. 
you can also submit yeah. ideas to Trevor. Just, just realists, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Well, All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Have a good night, everyone. You Take too. care, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Bye. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.